What's going on everybody, it's Itelmer and welcome back to my channel. So in today's video, I'm really excited to show you a new version of the XR Interaction Toolkit, which brings you a new set of features such as poke interactions, an affordance system for interaction feedback, a new redesigned device simulator, which I'm pretty excited about it, and also a sneak peek of the Gaze Interaction System, which is coming in future versions. So let's jump into my computer and start looking at it. You can right click on that folder and then show in Explorer. Once you do that, you should be able to see a Windows like this, and then you can go into Package, and then double click on the manifest.json. So in here, what I did is I just basically just added that line, and, and that line would allow you to install it without having to, you know, to go crazy and thinking, okay, where is it in the Package Manager? Because you won't really see it. Once you do that and you save your changes, you add that line, which I'm gonna be putting in the description of this video, you can go into Windows and then Package Manager, and now you should be able to see that we have the XR Interaction Toolkit, which is the version, you know, as of today. This might be, you know, pre that two or three, depending on when Unity decides to release that. Then the other thing that I also actually did is I went into Samples here, and I recommend that you import, you're gonna get the import instead of re-import. Just import the started assets, which is going to contain basically a rig that has all the different interactors that we're gonna be using. I think it's a lot easier to start that way than actually going in and adding every single one of them. So at least it'll give you more of a heads up of how to start. And then also make sure you import the XR device simulator. So once you import them, you should be able to see a folder here called samples and then XR interaction toolkit. The started assets is what I am using right now, which is the complete XR original setup. So if you go in here and you look at prefabs, you're gonna see that I have this complete XR origin setup. You can also look at the teleport area setup. So there's multiple examples in there that you can use. This is really cool because it has everything already set up for you. I could walk you through everything, but I think this is, the, like I said, a lot easier to do it this way. You can look at the different controller setup on the left hand. So if I were to you know, double click in here, you can see that I have a controller already set up and this was already set up for me. Also the drag interactor, ray interactor, teleport interactor, which we're gonna be using in this scene. And also the poke interactor, which is one of the new features available in this video. So if you go into the right hand, this one is gonna be for a smooth locomotion, which means that it's going to basically allow us to move around. You can also use the right hand to do teleporting. So this already has everything set up for you. So the next thing that I want you to do is go into file and then build settings go into player settings. And if you haven't done this already in the past, just make sure you go into the XR plugin management. Once you do that, if you haven't installed it, you'll see an option in there to install it. Make sure you install it. Once it's installed, you can basically enable the Oculus plugin provider, which we're going to be using the MetaQuest Pro for this video. And then for Android, just make sure you do Oculus. That way, when you deploy, it's going to, basically it's going to work on those devices. Then the next thing is make sure that you go into this option in here for Oculus and enable the Quest Pro if you're using a Quest Pro. If you're using a Quest 2 or a Quest, I think those are going to be enabled by default. So there's a new XR Pork Interactor that allows you to basically get close to a 3D object or a UI component and just do a poke action. So this is gonna be new. The XR Pork Interactor is new. There's also different settings in here for, you know, for poke, the depth, the width the select width, the radius, so you can change those as need. The other thing that I also wanna make sure that you know that is new is the require poke filter. This is really cool because not only, uh, you can poke on multiple items like, if you like, if you disable these, as long as they have an XR interactable or simple interactable component, but if you want to enforce additional rules just to make sure certain objects are pokeable, I think that's a word, <laughs> then you can enable this. I, I enable it because I wanna show you the poke filter. And then if you want to enable this with, you know, UI interactions, which we have in this scene, then you wanna make sure that you have that enabled. And then there's different events that you can intercept. In my case, I have a logger in here. So this logger, it's going to be, I, I decided to do it this way to do it a little bit different, but it's a basically a big logger right on that window. And what's gonna happen is we're gonna be using this logger to basically log when we are poking on an object and when the select enters and also 
when the action select XA gets executed, we'll be able to see those two messages. So if you look at these ones, these are called XR simple interactables because this has a component called XR simple interactable, which is basically the most basic XR interactable available. It basically inherits from one of the base classes for interactables. This one just allows you to basically capture whether you're hovering over an object, exiting out of the hover, and also I believe there's also a couple of select methods in here. So these objects are cool because I can now also target them to be able to do uh, what's called a, an XR poke filter. So if I want to interact with this and do something when I'm poking with a controller, then I can add a XR poke filter because on my XR interactor, the poke interactor, I told it to require a poke filter. So just make sure that you know that. Otherwise, if you set these two, this, basically if you don't enable it, it's going to apply to all objects. So in my case, I wanted to just apply to these objects. I don't want to poke on these other objects. So that's how you can differentiate between the two, which, which I think it's pretty cool and pretty smart from Unity to do that. So basically what happens is you're gonna need uh, an interactable, which in my case, I have this one. And then you can add this XR poke filter, which is going to use that interactable. If you don't associate it, it'll do it automatically for you behind the scenes. And then also a poke collider, which in this case, I do have a collider on these objects, which is a cube collider. And you guys can see actually a box collider, which you can see on, on this grid right here in green. And then you also have what's called a poke configuration, which is really cool. There's two ways to go about doing this. You can associate it with an asset or you can just set the values in here. So the asset is cool because you could go in here, go into assets to say that you wanted to put those in a folder, you can right click in here, create. And then they also have these XR value datums, I think is how you say it. And then you can basically designate a poke uh, configuration. I'm not gonna say how it's called because it's really confusing. It's basically a configuration for poke in different parameters. So for instance, like if I go back into this object and we go in here, the poke direction on, on that configuration, poke configuration is set to Z. So if you wanted all objects to have that, you could basically just set a specific configuration and then associate all your objects to that. Or if you wanna have different categories, which I think you would for more a more complex scenario. And then you can also set whether you want to have an offset. So if I wanted to do an offset, you're gonna see there's gonna be kind of like a blue lining here that designate the offset of the poke. So which means that if I get within this area, it's going to allow me to poke on that object. In this case, I want to touch the objects. I want to be very close, so I set it to zero. You can also designate an angle. So if you just want to have maybe a 45 angle that you want to allow for the poke, you can do that, or you can increment that as needed in here. So you just have to enable it. I just disable it. I just wanted to poke them as soon as I got close to them, so I didn't really need that. So that is poke. Then on the UI side, I also have the, the, this basically works with poke because on the poke interactor, I also enable UI interaction. So that's what's going to allow me to do that. So if I go back in here to the UI, so you can see that this has a track device graphic ray caster, and this is what's going to be required for you to be able to do pokes with UI. The Unity team already went behind the scenes and incorporated the poke implementation to this track device graphic ray caster. So there's really nothing else that you need to do that. I didn't have to go into any of these buttons and tell it that I wanted to allow a poke. It basically just works. And I wanna show you here that I can poke every single one of these objects. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that, do that, poke it a little bit more. And there's gonna be actions in here that get printed to the log, poke select the exit, poke select the enter. So I know the poke interactor is emitting those different actions. So let's go ahead and get back and look at the UI. So on the UI piece, I can get closer in here. Hopefully I don't hit my monitor and I can actually select the button. I think I hit my monitor a little bit, but that's okay. I can also do that. So I'm poking and the actual logger, it's printing the information. So I know the poke actions are getting executed. I can also do this later in here and I am basically binding to the on value change event and that's why that is working. So this works really, really well. I can go in here. I can also, you know, select these drop downs. So the next feature that I want to show you, it's going to be the affordance system. And I don't know why Unity named it that. <laughs> they always use difficult names. At least they're difficult for me to say. But anyways, this affordance system, it's going to allow us to basically do interaction feedback. So 
Anytime that we're interacting with an object, we change the color, we can change the size by actually scaling the object, which is what I'm doing on all of these ones right here. So the way that it works is you're normally going to have some type of interactable component associated with one of those objects. So in this case, if you look at it, normally you start with the actual interactable. So if I were to move this up, that way it makes more sense. You're going to have an XR simple interactable. This could be an XR grabbable interactable. Any of the ones that they have will work for this. So you're going to have an XR simple interactable in this component. For instance, I also have one for the tape, one for this medicine jar, and also one for this gun. So the way that it works is I have the interactable associated with it. I also have what's called an XR interactable affordance state provider, which is basically what keeps track of the state of the interactable and brings that into the affordance system. So if you wanted, for instance, to capture and in this case, scale the objects, I added that component. You also can designate what the transition duration is going to be. So if you want this to be a really slow scaling, you know, transition, you can increment this number. This, this is a really good number. So I went with that. You also can determine whether you want to ignore hover events and different options and also some animating configuration options. If you use it as default, this is going to work just great. And then I also added what's called a uniform transform scale affordance receiver that allows me to basically scale this object. So the way that it works is you create these components called the, if I go in here and right click in this area and go into create, I'm trying to remember what they're called, but they put them under affordance theme and you can have a color affordance theme, which means that you can change the color when the affordance system, you know, gets used. You can also change a flow value. You can change the vector two, three, and four, or also use a, an audio affordance theme. So in my case, I ended up using, in this case, I have two different ones. I have one for color and I also have one for a flow value. So in the case that I want to scale the object, this is what I'm using to scale it. So if we go back into here, into the hammer, you can see that I have the affordance theme datum associated with that object. And if I go back in here, and, and the way that it works is whenever this gets triggered, it's basically going to receive this kind of like an action, an event, and then it's gonna be using these parameters to determine what it needs to do. So if you look at the list of states, when this object is disabled, value is gonna be set to zero, which in this case is gonna set the scale to be zero. So I wouldn't want that, but this object is not going to be disabled, at least not in this application. But when it's idle, I'm gonna set it to one, which means that this hammer scale value is gonna be set to one all the way across. So if I go back to that, let's go ahead and go back into the flow. Whenever it's hover, we're gonna be changing this to be two, and you can animate, this is gonna be basically the start and the end of that animation. So whenever the hover happens, this is gonna have a value of two. And then if you wanted to increment it to maybe 2.5, you can do that. And then if you're using hover priority, it's gonna be from one to two. And then in this case, I think I'm just gonna set it to two and two. And then when we have the object selected, we're gonna go from a two to a three. And then when it's activated, we're basically going to be going to a number three. So this will be a really cool, you know, item selection. Like if you wanted to do this for your own game, you can do that. And also when I select it, so in here, I'm basically using this button in here on the controller to select it and I made it a lot larger. I can also do that here with the tape. The jar is a lot larger. And again, you can change the transition value, the scale value. And there's a lot of things that you can do with a system like this. I wanna set one of these up from scratch. So we're gonna be basically changing the color of the screen whenever we're grabbing the screen and moving it around. So it's really easy because all you really need to do is we can go in here and we're gonna be adding a component called XR Grab Interactable. That's going to be basically our core component and it's gonna add a rigid body automatically for us. And we're gonna leave all these by default. Then the next thing that I need to do is I'm gonna be adding a component called Affordance State Provider, which is basically here on the very bottom. And again, we can just leave everything as default. You can change the transition if you like. Maybe 1.5 I think works great. And then what we can also do is I'm gonna change the color of these components. So if I do search for color, you're gonna see that there's gonna be a color affordance receiver. I'm gonna be changing the material though on, on the screen because this component has two different renders. So if I go here, there's two different objects, one of them from the overall part of the TV. And then there's also one for the screen itself. So I want to make sure that I select the render 
object on the second one. So I can go ahead and drag it. If you have multiple materials, you can also designate which index the material is going to be that you want to change. So in my case, it's going to be zero. And then you can also change what property you access on the material. In my case, I'm going to be accessing the color property. So just make sure you do that. They set it to base color and that actually is not going to work. Just make sure that you change that to underscore color or something that is available on the material shader. And then the next thing that I need to do is I need to designate what the value it's going to be where I'm making the, the color change. So what I'm going to do here, I actually have the settings in here and we can just drag and drop here the default color and then drag it and drop it. And again, this is pretty simple. It's just going to change on hover is going to be green, on selected is going to be yellow, activator is going to be red. All right, let's go ahead and test it out. You can see that the color is changing on the TV, changing to green when I have a hover. You can also, you know, actually grab it and move it around. I can bring it in. I can rotate the TV if I wanted to. Maybe we'll just put it far from us. And the cool thing that I can also do here is I can also activate it. You can see how it's changing to red when I'm basically pressing the trigger button on the controller. So if you go in here and you were to add a new component, you can go ahead and right click in here and basically go into the gaze interactor. And in my case, I'm going to be using action base. So you can add the gaze interactor and you can see and look at all the different options that are available. We could use it as we could use array with our eyes. But currently the MetaQuest Pro, it's not fully working with this version. They're working on basically updating the plugin because there are permissions that they need to be able to implement. If you remember the eye tracking video that I did with the MetaQuest Pro, we had to get permissions. And once we got permissions, we needed to get the post information. Well, the Unity team needs to actually implement that. And I know they're working on because I talked to the Unity team. So just know that this feature is going to be coming up. And also in addition to the Gaze Interactor, there's also going to be gaze components and, and options on the interactable. So in this case, let's say that we look at the XR Simple Interactable. You can go in here and say, well, I want to allow gaze interaction by just checking this. There's also, also a volume, the, a snap volume that works with the gaze components that we're going to be able to use. And then if we go back into the TV here, you can see that we also have, if I go into the XR, grab interactable. There's also an allow gaze interaction if we wanted to use that when the gaze becomes fully compatible with the MetaQuest Pro. So for now, we can just, you know, know that it's coming. And then lastly, what I want to show you is how we can use one of the coolest features, which is the device simulator. And I'm not a professional by using it, but I'm going to show you how it works. Let me go ahead and make this a little bit bigger. And again, if you want to enable it, remember, we need to go into build settings, player settings, and we're gonna go into the XR Interaction Toolkit. And we need to tell it to use the device simulator in scenes. And also you need to make sure you have that prefab by importing that from the package managers samples that I show you at the beginning of the video. And then you also might get a warning and that warning it's going to allow you to, basically it'll do a fix to apply this teleport to layer 31. Okay, so I got this running on the device simulator and I'm moving my mouse around. You can kind of see, you know, all the different areas. The controllers are there as well. I can also hit tap and it's going to, you know, associate that to the left controller. Basically it's going to activate it. I can move my mouse around. It's going to basically move the left controller. I can hit tap again and now the right controller is the one you know, select it. And you can see how I can select the jar there. I can select the tape. I can select the TV and it changes the color of the TV because it is simulating the ray movement during play mode, which is really cool. I can also basically do shift and space at the same time. And now I can move, I can basically select both of the controllers, which is really, really cool. And the other thing that I can also do if I wanted to tap, now I can go back to the HMD. So what if you wanted to move around? You can, you know, W to move forward, S to move back, A to move to the left, and then D to move to the right, which is, you know, pretty standard for movement in different games and experiences. I can also go back into the left controller, and if I were to move the, uh, actually scroll with my mouse, you can see how I can kind of tilt it and, and rotate it completely if I wanted to rotate it. I can also hold the middle mouse and basically move my, controller around. If I wanted to get it closer there, I can do that. So just play with those different tools because they're going to be very, very powerful. Let's go ahead and do the right controller now. I'm going to go ahead and move it closer and then maybe just my mouse click in here to put it in place. 
So you guys can see how that works. So I am clicking on the A button. Let me see if I can do the big one there. And that works. I can basically just, you know, select anything that I like from there. Let's go ahead and go back and see if I can teleport to that other area. If you hit, I think it's the G key. Yep. If you hit G, it's basically going to do a select. And now I teleport it. I can go back in here. Let me try to do, I'm going to go ahead and align here better. Let me just move both of the controllers. So I'm holding shift and space and also the mouse a scroll wheel, and then I can move both of them. But what I want to do is I want to select the, the TV and actually move the TV. Let me go ahead and do right controller. And then I can do G and I'm going to hold G and then you can see how that works. And I can rotate it because I'm rotating my, my controller. I can also bring it closer, you know, move it far away from me, but it just gives you an idea of the power of the device simulator, which is a lot better than it used to be from the previous version. So that's honestly everything that I wanted to show you. Obviously, this is currently in pre-release, so I wouldn't recommend that you use it just yet, but I want you to, you know, start looking into some of these features. And if you guys have any questions about this, if you want to get a copy of the code of the project that I have available, make sure that you follow me and support me in Patreon because that's going to allow me to make a lot more videos. So that's everything for today. Thank you very much, guys.